but because we have more information that you will enjoy tonight, I promise you. Special greeting to uh, Pastor Don and Pastor Minta Baker. We, uh, we're so glad to see you because you're great people in, in God and we love you in Jesus' name. Give them a clap, please, everybody. Good. Wonderful. Uh, the, the, the Bakers and the Smiths are very close. Thank you, Pastor Norman and Pastor Ruth, for inviting me to be with you again. And I wish May was here. She's having an operation on her knee. Couldn't make it this time, but maybe next time. So God bless. So tonight, everybody, we're in for a good time. I have a lot of information here. I'm going to go very quickly because we must try and finish this meeting by 9 tonight and get off the property by 9.30. That's the rules. So let's do it. Then the neighbours won't get excited. <laughs> you know, the only way to beat that is get the neighbours, get the neighbours saved. They all need to be here. That's the point. Now, anybody who's interested in the books and tapes, very quickly, please, brother, if you can do it again tonight, there's the website address. Any of you who are on the web, please uh, feel free to write that down. It's, uh, <clears throat> that's the name of our magazine, www.omegatimes.com. Also, we're doing a trip to Israel this year again, God willing. If anybody would like to join us, please take one of the brochures. They're on the book table in the front there. And don't laugh, just come with us. If it's too dangerous, we won't go. I mean, I want to stay alive too, you know. So just, if, if, it, if it gets a bit sticky at the time, we'll postpone it and put it on a wee bit later. So God bless you. Take one of those tonight. At least you get a picture of my wife and myself. If, no. <laughs> if you'd like to subscribe to the Amiga Times, there it is on the, on the web. That's the website number. This is our newspaper. And we invite you to put your name on a piece of paper if you're not on the web and your address, give it to me and I'll take it back to New Zealand and make sure you get one of those. The books are on the table tonight again. Warning, written in 1978. Second warning, final notice, P.S., better than Nostradamus. The Devil's Jigsaw is the one that has the picture in of the Twin Towers. You know, we, we did this three and a half years before it happened. Have a look at this one. There it is. There's the um, Twin Towers. There's the aeroplane flying. There's the anthrax in the sky, and that was done in the year 1998. That was in my book. I have people coming from all over the media in different parts of the world calling me. Had a team from uh, Japan down recently interviewing me in New Zealand to know how it all happened, and they put it on TV the next night in Japan. So there you go. The next book is called I Spy with My Little Light. They're all different and all full of good information. So God bless you. Also, the banner above my head. Uh, it's not above my head. It's over there, actually. It's usually above my head, but tonight it's over there. There it is, in full colour. Most people purchase two, one one way, one the other, and the Lord will bless you as you keep up to date with Bible prophecy. <clears throat> All right, so uh, that's great. Last night we learnt that the, uh, the world government is coming about uh, based on the seal on the seals on the back of the American dollar. We learnt that in America many people do not notice these seals because every day they spend them, look, we spend them, we don't read them, they say. And the same applies to people in Australia. They spend them, they don't read them. And unless you're desperate for reading material, you do not normally read your bank notes, you'll agree. <laughs> and therefore, that's why many people in the States do not know about these things here. These are witchcraft seals. And tonight, we're going to talk about the Illuminati. We move on from there. And we find that today, in the year 2002, there is a modern Illuminati, the original Illuminati, were the designers of the two seals in 1776, which date is on the base of the pyramid there. 1776 does not stand for July the 4th, Declaration of Independence, but stands for May the 1st, when the inauguration of the Illuminati took place. Uh, these two seals were placed on the back of the dollar by a man called Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the year 1933, and prior to that, the American dollar did not have those seals on the back. He, by the way, was a 32nd degree Mason and put it there because Freemasons are mixed up in the plan very, very vitally. And now we've learned that uh, the world government plan is Foundation 1776, if you were here last night, Illuminati. The framework for the house, they use the analogy of the building of a house. The framework of the house went up in New Zealand, my country, in the year 1987. Then in came the electrician, that was Y2K. All the um, computers were synchronized and upgraded. We have now entered an electronic new world order. And the man in charge of the task forces, 25 task forces, whose name was John Koskaken, said, we have now entered an electronic new world order, and I can run the world with four people. 
I can, let's say it together, I can now run the world with four people. Understand that, please. At a cost of $640 billion, American dollars, they upgraded and synchronized the computers worldwide, and through fear, even countries that couldn't afford to do so did so. And now we are ready for the roof on the house, which is the worldwide money crash. We've noticed that Japan is almost bankrupt. The Americans have cut the interest rates 11 and a half times. Greenspan of the Federal Reserve says he can't cut them anymore because it will destroy the whole world currency system. We've learned that the Japanese have how much money invested in America? Half a trillion dollars. So if they take their money out of the American banks, they will collapse the world economy overnight. Japan, sorry, uh, Argentina is defaulting on their loans. Worldwide, there are monetary problems. The whole of banking is based on confidence, and what you hear in my meetings, you will never hear from an economist, because it's all based on confidence. I'm not here to give you confidence in the system of the world. I'm here to give you confidence in the system of God. And if you're taking notes, write this down, please. When the whole thing goes, what are we going to do? Write this down. The economy of this world is, is buying and selling. The economy of heaven is giving and receiving. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. And so we will gather much more together as we see the day approaching. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Plenty of fellowship. And we went through revival in the islands years ago in Samoa. I want to tell you, when revival hits, you won't want to go home. And all the neighbors will get saved and we can have longer meetings. <laughs> How long did our meetings take? How long were our meetings in the island? They lasted all night. It's no use having a babysitter because they all get saved. <laughs> so you bring your children to church as well. They sleep on the floor. MOF, mattress on floor. <laughs> and so some of you are worried about the economy. Some of you got a lot of money. Some of you got none. The, the <laughs> when I speak on the Gold Coast, I can always tell the millionaires. They look like death as they walk out. <laughs> all the poor people are chuckling all the way. <laughs> we do a lot of work in, in England. I'll be up there in June, God willing, next month. I've got a month in, in England and Ireland. We'd go twice this year over there. And I was in Ireland one time. I heard of a woman there who said she had no economic problems whatsoever. I said, what's her name? Well, he said, first of all, they said she throws her bills in the fire. I said, who is she? He said, Bernadette. <laughs> oh, dear. Do you, know, do you know, just the other day, I, I, I read an article about the world's first economist. If you're taking notes, write this down. The world's first economist was Christopher Columbus. He set off not knowing where he was going. And when he got there, he didn't know where he was. And it was paid for by the government. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. So I like, I like jokes. Anybody else? I better stop. That's enough. Time's going. Now, we've learned already that the American government is controlled by Freemasonry. We learned last night, those of you who are in the meeting, that in the streets of Washington, D.C., are the Masonic symbols. The Masonic symbols, there they are. The compass, this is a map of Washington, D.C. One of my relations through marriage uh, flies aeroplanes into there regularly. He tells me you can see it from the air. There's the compass, the Masonic compass, the square. Notice the end of the compass finishes right at the White House here. Would you notice also the uh, five-pointed star? That's the pentagram. Turn it up on its side, please, would you mind? The one point down, put the point down, please. Turn it around the other way. And we notice that anybody into witchcraft knows what that is. You put the head of the goat in there, the goat's head. The name of the goat is, is called the goat of Mendes. And the demon inside the goat is called Baphomet. Have a look at this. And therefore, would you notice where the beard of the goat stops? Right at the White House. The president of America at all times is hit by witchcraft from two different directions. And I've had university students try and argue with me. I say, don't argue, just go to the library, check it out, you'll find it's correct. These two satanic symbols are there. But I give thanks to God tonight that George Bush has received Christ, but he belongs... Listen, hang on before you start shouting. <laughs> he also belongs to a satanic group. We learned that last night. The name of the group is the Skull and Bones. 
Now remember last night we learned in the original Illuminati started by Adam Weishaupt, he said every member of this club must have a secret name. What was the secret name given to, to uh, Adam Weishaupt, please? Spartacus, that's correct. We learned that George Bush Sr. and his father before him and George W. Bush were all members of a group called the Skull and Bones or the Order or 322. That is the modern Illuminati. They control the affairs of this world. Uh, they lie in a coffin, all this sort of stuff. If you were in the meeting last night, you learned all that. Now, we learned that George Bush Sr. had a secret name. What was his secret name? Poppy. Poppy. And we learned that George W. Bush has a secret name, which is? Temporary. Temporary. And that's a very dangerous sort of a situation he's in. I said, if I had a name like that, I'd be very nervous. Because I've just been preaching right across the states from Portland, Oregon, 13 major cities all the way to Baltimore on the east coast and then to New Orleans in two and a half weeks, 7,000 miles by motor car. And what I give you tonight, I have preached in America. And the people, I, God gave this to me as soon as I arrived there. I knew I had to go and I'm going to share it with you tonight. So God bless everybody. Here we go. <laughs> Put this one on, please. Has anybody heard of an obel obelisk? Okay, have a look at these, please. We find that the whole world system <clears throat> is, has Freemasonry all over the place. Sydney has it. You've got Freemasons everywhere. The big lodge is down Goldburn Street, I think. I think I've seen it there. Would you notice, please, the obelisk in London, the obelisk in New York, the obelisk in St. Peter's Square, Rome, and the obelisk in Washington? That's a symbol of Freemasonry. Now, just put it down for a moment and bring it back to me, bro, so I can get back to that later. I want you to notice that we're going to prove something later by pointing out the meaning of the obelisk. So we'll put that in later to the meeting. Okay. Now, 666 is here. First of all, we notice that in, on, in the, September the 11th in the year uh, 2001, uh, we were in, in our bed in New Zealand. I received a telephone call that this has happened. Most of you remember that happening very well. Uh, my wife and I were sitting up in bed and we got a telephone call from the Gold Coast. A friend of mine there said, turn on CNN. We, I want to say t this evening to all of you that the Bible tells us God does nothing, but he reveals first his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amen. Amos chapter 3 verse 7, let's say it together. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so we find and there's another scripture also from Joel chapter 2 where God promises to help us in these latter days with three things. And we're going to look at them. Joel 2.28 all together. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your younger men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God has promised by his grace and mercy to help us with our understanding of world events by giving us three things. Let's say them together, please. Prophecy, dreams, and visions. We must be very careful, however, not to believe every prophecy, every dream, and every vision because some of them come about through eating too much fruitcake late at night. <laughs> You agree with that? It must fit in with what God says. And there's a lot of strange people around giving us strange interpretations. I don't want strange Christianity. I want normal. And so we see then that God is gracious to us. He has revealed many, many things to three people in particular. And I put their names on here. Have a look at these. The first man I have on the list is a man called David Wilkerson. Some of you will have heard of this man, the author of the book, The Cross and the Switchblade. He was told month after month that New York would be attacked, ultimately. He saw it in vision form. I, now, I trust that man because the Bible test of a prophet is that he must get it correct. If you get it wrong, you're done. And so people say to me, are you a prophet, Barry Smith? The answer is no. Because the penalty for making mistakes was rather drastic. What was it, please? stoning to death. So I make it very clear, I am not a prophet. <laughs> I am simply a commentator on world events, or a speaker, a talker. And uh, I've made mistakes. I, I told the people years ago, I can't, went through uh, South Australia, I told them there that George Bush Sr. would win a second term in the White House. He didn't. 
Bill Clinton got the job, and so I had to write letters to Andrew Evans and all the other people along the South Australian coast there and explain that I made a mistake. I said, read this from the pulpit. My name is Barry Smith. I made a mistake. <laughs> it's important. Don't try and cover the thing up. And so the reason that George Bush Sr. did not win a second term was twofold. Number one, he was very sick with a sickness called Graves' disease, and number two, he vomited on a high Japanese official. That did not go down very well in diplomatic circles, and thus he lost his job. So I made a mistake. The second man was a man called Dimitri Dudeman, and some years ago we were in Canada, and we had a night off, so I said to my wife, let's go to a meeting. How would you like to have a husband like that? Get a night off, you go to a meeting. And I heard that this dear old man Dudeman was preaching in a, in a camp situation nor in northern Canada, in British Columbia. So that night a friend drove us up to the camp. This dear old man stood up. He was a Romanian pastor who had been through the mill under communism. This was his story, interpreted by his grandson. And he has written a book, and I've got his signature in the book. It's called Through the Fire Without Burning. There's the old man's signature. But he's gone to be with Jesus now. This is the story. He said he was a Pentecostal pastor in Romania. And when the communists took over, they put him in prison. They were angry with him for preaching the gospel. While he was in prison, they put his hand in the door and they slammed the door on his hand. <clears throat> they, would, they would kick him around. They broke his bones and his body and so on. They put him in a river for three days and three nights and soaked him and then beat his paralyzed body. While he was going through all these tortures, an angel of God stood next to him and said, Fear not, Dimitri. God has plans for you. Be strong and we will bring you out of this. That's good. The, the communists finally gave up torturing this man and they said, we'll let you go, but you must not preach the gospel. So he started carrying Bibles into Russia. And the car that they drove in had the angel sitting on the bonnet of the car. And as they drove along, the angel would put his arm to the left or to the right and carry them through the border into Russia. He carried tens of thousands of Bibles in there. And the communists said, we know what you're doing, but we don't know how you're doing it. <laughs> they said, we will now banish you to America. Now, this poor man was sent to Los Angeles. And some of you who have been there will understand. He came from a beautiful green country and he was put into one of the slum areas of Los Angeles uh, with these tall apartment buildings, the smog all around, the smell of urine from the lifts and so on. Just a filthy place. Big rubbish dumps outside his, his house. He said, I sat on a rock and I cried. I said, Lord, why don't you let me go back to Romania? The green hills, the grass, the trees, the rivers. I don't want to sit in this mess over here. I don't understand the English language and so on. And he was very sorry for himself. He saw a light coming towards him. He thought it was a motorbike, but it wasn't. It was his angel. And the angel said, come with me, Dimitri. God has a message that you must preach. He took him over California and said, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one hour, it will burn. Took him over Las Vegas. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one hour, it will burn. Took him over Florida. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one hour, it will burn. Took him over New York. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one hour it will burn. And then Dimitri said, Lord, what's going on? He said, don't you love the Christians? He's, and the Lord spoke and said to him, in many cases the Christians here do not worship me. They worship themselves. That's a powerful word. And he said, you must go around and you must warn the people. Unless they repent, I will judge this country in a very big way. And um, <clears throat> then he said, well, Lord, uh, if that is true... He said, what's going to happen to the real believers? He said, they will flee to the mountain, and the mountain is Christ. They will flee to the mountain. Why are you going to judge this country, Lord, said Dimitri. He said, because I founded it upon the word of God with the Pilgrim Fathers, the Bible, and prayer. But now they have cancelled prayer. They've cancelled the Bible from the schools, and they're letting heathen religions in here, and they're worshipping demons. Therefore, he said, I will judge this country unless they repent and turn in full repentance to me. That's a powerful word, everybody. You must shout this message everywhere you go. And the young man that drove me across America with the prophecy club's name was Michael. He said, I carried this man everywhere. And he had to preach this message. It was not very popular, but he had to do it. And he's gone to be with Jesus now, but the message remains. And so we were not surprised when this happened. Now, when I listened to what Dimitri Dudeman said, I thought, goodness me, what a horrible message to have to preach. And so he said, Lord, when the people say to me, what scriptures have I got for this? What, would you, what will I tell them? Write it down, please. Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51, and, Jeremiah, sorry, and Revelation chapter 18. 
Jeremiah chapter 50, Jeremiah 51, and Revelation chapter 18. Now, many years ago, there was a great king called Nebuchadnezzar, and he was the king of a great empire called Babylon. Now, Babylon is where a man lives today who's causing a lot of trouble. What's his name? Saddam Hussein, and it is the country of Iraq. That's where Babylon is. Saddam Hussein is trying to rebuild the ancient walls of Babylon. He has already put in over 50 million bricks, I believe, with his name on them. And he's got pictures of himself alongside Nebuchadnezzar. He sees himself as a modern Nebuchadnezzar. But the prophet Isaiah said the city of Babylon will never be lived in again. He's wasting his time. But in the last days, a new system will arise, which is not Babylon. It is called Mystery Babylon. And when I was a young man, I used to hear the old Bible preachers, and they told me that Mystery Babylon was found in Revelation chapter 17, and it was the city of the seven hills, the city of Rome. This has been taught for years. However, they neglected, they neglected to look up the Word of God in the book of Revelation. Put this one on, please. Chapter 16 and verse 19 is a key verse. Now, Mystery Babylon is not only the city of Rome, but Mystery Babylon is made up of three geographical regions, and we're going to look at them tonight. Revelation 16, 19 altogether. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so we see that this final world system before the common market comes to power with the Antichrist, is called Mystery Babylon. It is made up of three geographical parts. Revelation 17 would be the spiritual part, or the religious part, and Revelation chapter 18, in the main, is the economic and the political part of this massive world system that will ultimately yield up its power to Europe and the Antichrist, and under the euro dollar, which is now in operation, affecting the lives of 300 million people more than the population of the United States. You understand what I'm saying? Now that the Twin Towers have gone down, affecting 54 countries, the, the uh, trading center of the world will now move, prophetically speaking, from New York to the European community. And the Antichrist will be appointed shortly. They are looking for a president right now. I'm speaking to you tonight in Sydney. Uh, where are we? We're Penshurst, is it? In Penshurst. And the date is the 16th of May in the year 2002. The trade of the world will now go from New York to Europe and the Antichrist will run the whole system shortly. As God brings down Mystery Babylon, the three areas, what are the three areas? Answer, economy, New York, po politics, Washington, D.C., and, and religion, Rome. And each of those areas must add up to 666. Now, I have another book here. I don't know where I got hold of it. It's called The Last Days in America. I got this years and years ago. And if you were in the meeting last night, we learned that America was set up by two groups. First of all, the Pilgrim Fathers for Religious Freedom, correct? Remember? Could you put the dollar on again? Have you got it there, please? The American dollar, the picture of the dollar. <coughs> Have a look at this now, everybody. Now, here's the Pilgrim Fathers, look. There it is, In God We Trust. Pilgrim Fathers. They settled in the state of Virginia. They settled on the Word of God. They had great prayer meetings. They preached the gospel all over the world, and they've done a marvelous job. At the same time, we had the occult group, says the book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages, which we learnt last night, was written by a top Freemason, Manly Hall. Wherever God is, the devil's there. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Wherever there's a real, there's a counterfeit. The real is God. Almighty God and His Son Jesus, and the counterfeit is Satan, trying to replicate what God has done. And so we notice then, there we have the Eye of Lucifer. We were there last night, we learnt all this. We have the 13 layers of stone, which stand for the 13 degrees in Freemasonry. The words annuate chapter stand for announcing the conception of a novus ordo seclorum. The word seclorum is secular. Ordo means, or, ordo means order, and novus means new. Let's put the thing in, in uh, sequence. Lucifer, the eye in the triangle, which is now recognized as Satan, the god of this world, is saying, I am announcing the conception of a secular, heathenistic, ungodly, new world government, new world religion, new world law system, and new world money system called the Mark of the Beast. Over here we have the so-called American Eagle, which the Freemasons tell us is not an eagle, it is a 
A phoenix is a mystical bird that burns in the fire and rises again in the last days. Man's first attempt to set up a world government was the Tower of Babel. But in the last days, God is allowing another one to arise. It's called the New World Order. It's the phoenix rising out of the ashes of the Tower of Babel. And I want to say tonight, the same God that smashed the Tower of Babel is the same God who will smash the New World Order. Amen. And my country, New Zealand, was the test case for this wretched thing. And every foul thing they do, they practice on my country, New Zealand. Naughty fellas. <laughs> You'll see in the mouth of the bird there is a ribbon. On the, on the ribbon are written three words. They are air pluribus unum. The original idea was to uh, unite the 13 colonies in America and set up the United States because the meaning of that in English is out of many, one. Ten, three, thirteen. One United States. Now the plan is to privatize every country on earth, sell up the assets overseas where you are left with no power, no sovereignty, no independence. We all become interdependent and there'll be no more Australians, no more New Zealanders, no more Americans, no more Japanese, Chinese or Islanders. We will all be members of a global village with our arms around each other's shoulders, swaying backwards and forwards, singing, we are the world. <laughs> oh dear. Now, is everybody ready to go? Here we go. When Dudeman said, Lord, where will I find the scriptures? The answer came back, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51. Now tonight, I'm going to put these things on from his book. He has uh, 25 or 26 reasons why America is mentioned in prophecy. And some of these are taken from Jeremiah 50, others from 51, and others from Revelation 18. And I'd like to share these things with you tonight. Here we go. Would you call out yes if you think this is possible? It's either this one, what we're going to read tonight, either refers to the original Babylon, which is away inland, which is Iraq, way over beyond Jordan in the desert area, or refers to America. And we're going to have a look at this now. So I'll put it down here, USA plus Rome. So we've got two here and one here equals three, the three areas of Mystery Babylon. Let's go. Would you call out if you give a murmur of approval if you think it's possible we're on the right track? Put down a little pointer. Help me somebody. Ah, thank you. Okay, here we go. The youngest of the nations. It's a young nation. America is very young. What date is on the bottom of the pyramid? 1776. What date was Australia settled? About 1770, wasn't it? 17 what? 88. New Zealand, 1769. So we're all about the same, you see. Very similar. And, but it's interesting, we've all got different accents. When I was in the States, I, I said to the people, you people talk different to us. You've got the rolling R, you know. No matter where you go, it's R. You know. Now where does it come from? It comes from southern England. If you go to southern England, Somerset. They speak like that in Somerset. If, and also they had a lot of Irish immigrants who went across there and they also have the rolling R and within about 200 or ne less than 300 years they've got a whole accent right across the country. You Aussies have got an accent too, you know that, don't you? <laughs> Come on brother, let's face it. <laughs> What's your word? Chips. <laughs> and they reckon that we have an accent. Yeah. Oh, well, I can see I'm on hostile ground. <laughs> Have you noticed that if you live in a certain area, you develop your own words? You have all sorts of stuff you're talking about. I laughed. I came over here and someone said we were traveling through Australia years ago with the family with our mattresses and all our blankets and so on. And someone said, have you got your doona? I said, what the dickens is a doona? Never heard of it. <laughs> Listen, you Aussies. The correct word, it's a French word. Be more delicate, would you? Duvet. <laughs> Not doona. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'd never heard of a doona before. <laughs> Here we go, everybody. Next one. Born from a mother country, which was Britain. I haven't got time to go through all the scriptures. Just give you this now. A mighty military political power. So what you're doing in your mind, you're tossing up between Iraq and, and, and America, you see. An arrogant, proud and haughty nation. Don't be rude, please. People of foreign descent. 
When I went through the states recently, I went through 38 states. I went through German areas, Jewish areas, Italian areas, Dutch areas. They're from everywhere. You know that's true. Uh, covetousness reigns as people live sumptuously but want more as many in the world are starving. Next one, please. I've never seen so much food in my life. You go into a supermarket over there, it's absolutely amazing. A nation with a godly heritage. Come on, yes, based on the word of God, I told you. A nation of great wealth and prosperity. That's, it's funny, you know, they are broke. America is absolutely broke. The greenbacks are not worth the paper they're written on. And there's no gold backing. And when they want to cancel the money system, they can do it overnight because they're absolutely broke. And all they do is keep reprinting more money. You need to know that. They're the most, they're the most broke country in the world, I believe. But they're still lending. It's incredible. Wish I had a printing press like that. <laughs> <laughs> Great attainments. That's not Iraq, everybody. Space travelers. A home for cults and occult practice. Worldwide immorality. If you look at the programs, they are pretty disgusting. But not as bad as New Zealand. New Zealand programs are filthy. And New Australian programs are filthy. Have you noticed they've got these dirty things on like Survivor? And these ones, someone told me this on the Gold Coast a few days ago. I haven't seen them, but I've heard. They tell me Survivor. There's another one out like that. Big Brother and another one. Temptation on. They tell me in each of those, this man told me, he said, in all of those programs, they get rid of people. And he said, they're preparing us for world government. People don't see that. They went, and also, the other one is that woman in England, um, uh, what she you say? You are the weakest link. You're the weakest link. Goodbye. And that's what the world government's going to do. The strongest will live and the rest will go. Get the idea? They're preparing us. This is not by accident. Large, oh, at least the Americans have got the goodness to bleep the filthy words on television. But over here, every filthy thing goes. Aussies and Kiwis, I tell you what, disgusting. Large and foreign aid. Large imported to satisfy the lust of the people. The center of Christianity. You better believe it. They have sent more missionaries than anybody. In fact, one of the young men that influenced my life was one who was with the five young men who went to, among the Alka Indians years ago. Remember? They flew in on a plane uh, piloted by Nate Saint. Jim Elliott was the man. I think he wrote a book through Gates of Splendor. And he was, uh, they found his body lying in the river with a spear through him and pages of the New Testament. And he wrote this in his journal. Listen to it. A man is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I took a note of that and I thought, Lord, I can't hang on to my life and so I'm going to give it to you completely. Everybody hear this, please? In a hundred years, we'll all be gone. In a hundred years, we'll all be in heaven or hell, all of us. And that's why at the end of this meeting, I will give an invitation for anybody who does not know the Lord in a personal way. It's called Born Again Experience. You will stand in the front and pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I come to the cross where you died for me. I am a sinner. That's point number one. I repent of my sin, I turn away from it, and I turn to Jesus. Number two, I believe the Bible is true when it says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. There is only one blood that will save us, and that is the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Christ. And tonight I accept that. And number three, I receive Christ into my heart. The Bible says to as many as receive him, say it with me, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And everybody who receives Christ becomes a son of God. Let me tell you a story. I was preaching in the northern part of New Zealand recently, and uh, when I gave the invitation, I was preaching to the whole town. We had a combined service for all the churches, and when I gave the invite, all these people came to the front, and amongst them was a minister with his collar turned back to front. I've never seen this before, dressed in a black suit, and he stood with all the people, and his wife stood next to him. Even ministers need to get born again. And it was exciting. We prayed the sinner's prayer and I went along afterwards and I gave them all a new birth certificate. I've got some here tonight for those who give their lives to Christ. I said, have you received Christ? Yes, he said. They take that, they put the time and the date, they sign their name. And afterwards I went back to my seat. I said to my wife, May, I bet he's embarrassed because his congregation are all here. He's probably gone home. So I went outside to have a look. Listen, the old guy was dancing next to his car. And he said, this is the greatest day in my life. <laughs> he got born again, everybody. You can be religious and go to hell. But once you receive Christ, you'll go to heaven. It's called being born again. It's, it's, 
Religion is boring, but relationships exciting. And so the old man got saved, you see? It was so good. Anyway, back to this again. Um, large imported to satisfy the lust of the people, excessive crime, sexual permissiveness, homosexual freedom. Yes, yeah, good. You, you're very responsive. This is good, folks. Do you, know, do you know I go to some places, they won't talk? They sit there like this. It's not easy. I go to England a lot. It's not easy to get them talking. They're quiet people, you know. And I, I say to them, listen, you English people, I'm, I'm half a pom myself. My mother is English. She's from Newcastle. And I know what they're thinking. When I say, would you say something, please? They say, no, I won't. They're being rebellious, you see. Because I'm half English, I understand that attitude. I will not be manipulated from the front. That's what you say. I'm not trying to manipulate anybody from the front. I'm trying to keep you awake. So please keep talking, would you? Decadence of marriage vows. Proud and boastful people. Other countries' economic strength depends on her economic strength. World Trade Center. Extravagant taste. Nation of influential cities. Nation known for music. What city do you go to if you want to do well in music? National, that's West Country and Western. And if you want to do well in pop music, go to New York. A nation known for her crafts. A nation known for her food production. Her businessmen and corporations are known worldwide. And so we see tonight then that we're dealing with this, the country of America, which was set up, said Manly Hall, write this down please, for a particular and a peculiar purpose known only to the initiated few. Uh, what was the peculiar purpose? To put Lucifer on the throne of the world. We're living at the crunch time. Who was the man who introduced the new world order? George Bush, senior. In the year 1990, he kept using the term new world order, just as he was about to attack Saddam Hussein. He used the term so often that his advisor said, would you please stop using the term, people are asking what it means. And nobody really knew what it meant except people like us who knew what it was. It is a world government because the Bible tells us. Praise God for this book, everybody. That's the only book in the world that speaks with authority about where we came from. It's the only book in the world that speaks with authority about what we're doing here. It is the only book in the world that speaks with authority about where we're going to. And we need to listen to it. And God is telling us you'll have a mystery Babylon system with three geographical regions and then that will give over because God is going to judge those three regions and then we will move on to the final world government which is the ten nations of the inner core of the European Union. And so we, we learn that we are living in those days. And I'm so glad, you know, well I've done this most of my life, this sort of thing. Travelling around doing all this all the time. How would you like to preach this every night? At least if you're a pastor you can change your message. How would you like to be my wife? <laughs> Listening to it every night of the week. And she still laughs at my jokes. <laughs> Hear what this man said here? Pastor Don said, are you sure she's got a bad knee or she's just trying to keep away from me? <laughs> I never thought of that, brother. Now you've sown a seed in my mind. Oh, dear. I heard the story about a professor. He used to travel with his chauffeur all over the place. And one night he said to the chauffeur, you preach. He said, I'm sick to death of not talking on this subject. You know it off by heart. Now you speak. He said, I can't do that, said the chauffeur. Yes, you can. He said, you must know it by now. So that night the chauffeur got up and spoke. And the professor sat on the front row. And afterwards they said it was better than the original. <laughs> And everything was going well until the chairman said, we will now open the floor for questions. And a man at the back called out a very difficult question. And the chauffeur said, listen, he said, listen, sir, your question is so easy, I'm going to ask my chauffeur in the front row to answer it. <laughs> now, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the three regions. Here we go. Would you look at the three regions, please? Here we go. First of all, we notice New York is the home of Wall Street, the world economic system, and the home of the United Nations, and it adds up to 666. 
We notice that politically speaking, Washington DC is the seat of government in America, has 666 members of, in, in their government. And it is the Grand Lodge of Freemasonry's home where the man Albert Pike was buried in the wall of the Grand Lodge of, of Freemasonry. Pike was the man who said, th said this, Lucifer is God, but unfortunately Adonai is also God. And the Masons believe in a dualistic system, Adonai and Lucifer. Then they reverse the roles, Adonai becomes the bad side of God and Lucifer becomes the good side of God. That's why the lodge floor is always in checkers. Black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, you see. The policeman's hats around Australia. Black, white, black, white, all infiltrated by Freemasonry. And the sooner the thing is broken, the better. And the sooner the people recognize it as to what it is, it is a Luciferian system. And then we see religion, of course, 666, the Vatican, the city of the seven hills. I'll speak about that tomorrow night. I believe tomorrow night we have a little bit longer, which is good because tomorrow's a good one. No, not tomorrow, Saturday. You'll enjoy Saturday one, I promise you. That, to me, that is the top one on the religious aspect. And I tell you what, everybody, there's a 666 system in there. I'll deal with that on Saturday night. But I want you to see, first of all, we'll look at New York, shall we, and see how you do this. Here we go. I'll get this. Frida, would you mind covering up the others? Just bit by bit, please. Here it comes. Here we go. Now, first of all, we notice that if you're looking for a system, you go A equals 6. B equals 12, come on everybody, C equals 18, D equals 24. Just cover up all these, please. The people are bu busy looking at that instead of this. And that too, do you cover it up? It's too late, I think I've seen it. <laughs> That's good. Okay, there's your key. Now if you don't want to do it, let your children do it for you. Go right to Z, keep adding 6, which is the number of man. And when you do that, if you're looking for a world leader, you will look first of all at a man I have looked at since 1970. His name is Henry Kissinger. Please open it up, please. Here we go, Kissinger. Add together the letters for Kissinger comes to 666. He is a non-religious Jew. He is the public relations man for the New World Order. And he is still old enough to do the job and young enough to do the job. Everybody says to me, he's too old. No, he's not. Where was he when Yikshak Rabin was shot? Answer, he was in mainland China reuniting Hong Kong and China. Have you heard of a system called EFTPOS? Who introduced EFTPOS to Australia? Henry Kissinger. I can tell you the story now. Some years ago, we were over here. In fact, we've been coming here since 1972. And we were in another part of this country. On a hot night, someone said, come for supper. So we went out for supper, and this man had his daughter with him. Said, come on, dear, tell Mr. Smith what you know. He said, she works in a bank. And the girl said, no, I can't, Dad. I am bound to bank secrecy. And the father said, come on, tell Mr. Smith. He won't tell anybody. <laughs> and so she told me. And I had, I had to hold that for a long time. Listen, because that is called ethics. If someone tells you something in confidence, don't you blow it. Hold it. I held it. I'm now allowed to tell you because it's all over. The year was 1983. She said, you know, our bank manager told us next year, 1984, a man called Henry Kissinger is coming to this country. He's going to introduce a plastic card, which you, you, it'll help you to buy and sell stuff. And he said, that's going to be called FPOS. Sure enough, in 1984, who came to this country? Henry Kissinger. Where does he come into? Richmond Air Force Base out the back here. He doesn't fly into Sydney Airport. Oh, no. It's Richmond Air Force Base. He comes in a black car with black curtains. He visited Gloucester, had a look at the coal mines. He went down to Canberra, spoke to the leaders there of the economic system, the Prime Minister, and then flew out back again. Away he went. You say, how do you know? Because his bodyguard got saved in my meeting. I was preaching at Nowra. You heard of Nowra? And one night this man came to the front with all these. He said, everything you said tonight about Kissinger was correct. I was his bodyguard. And when I took him to the airport on the last day, I said, have you achieved what you set out to achieve, Mr. Kissinger? He said, more than you will ever know. He set up FPOS in this country. Have you heard of GST? <laughs> Who brought GST to New Zealand? Answer, Henry Kissinger. I got a call from the tax department. I have informants all over the world. He said, guess who's here this morning? I said, who? He said, Henry Kissinger. He's bringing in a thing called goods and services tax. When Yikshak Rabin was killed that night, we were in Jerusalem. He was killed in Tel Aviv. Someone rang my room in the hotel, said, look on CNN. And at about quarter past 11 that night, it says, Yikshak Rabin has been wounded. A bit later, it said, he's dead. A spirit of death went right through Israel at that time. 
And then the next man that came on CNN was Lawrence Eagleburger, the ex-Secretary of State. He said, we have lost a great statesman in Yikshak Rabin, but the peace process will not die. There is only one who could continue on with it, and I speak of Henry Kissinger. And then the next man to come on was Henry Kissinger himself. He said, we have lost a good friend. He was actually weeping on television. He said, but the peace process will continue. We will continue with it. Now, have you heard of a man called uh, Ariel Sharon? Do you know when he goes to America, the first man he visits is Henry Kissinger? Have you heard of a person called uh, Colin Powell? Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, he, he goes to his advisor, who is Henry Kissinger. Have you heard of a girl called Condoleezza Rice? the National Security Advisor, the little black girl with a gap between her teeth. Her advisor is Henry Kissinger. These people all go to Kissinger because he is the man involved in Middle East politics from behind the scenes. And we're looking for a non-religious Jew to bring about a seven-year treaty. And the man who does that, who confirms it, is called Antichrist. We will find out sooner or later. Just keep watching, that's all I say. I'll tell you something else. There is a man called Horowitz who has wrote, written a book called AIDS, Ebola and Emerging Viruses, who rang me one night from New York. He said, did you help to set up the AIDS cure in Kenya? I said, yes. I helped to set up this man over there. His name is Basil Wainwright. He is using polyatomic oxygen and, and turning people into HIV undetectable by injecting ozone into their blood. He simply takes the black blood out of cancer and AIDS patients. It runs it through a cascade tube. I've watched it many times. He fires ozone gas into it. It turns the blood red as he oxygenates it, puts it back into that arm, comes in red, out black in red, and in about seven treatments, the patient is declared HIV undetectable. And the sooner the doctors in this country get onto it, they can clean all the blood bags in 13 seconds in the hospitals. All you do is bubble ozone through a blood bag. So if you know any doctors, challenge them, would you please? And this man, Leonard Horowitz, is the man who discovered where the AIDS virus was created. It's even got a patent on it. It's, so if you catch AIDS, you should pay a patent. Now listen to this, everybody. He said the only man he can see on the world scene that could possibly fulfill the job of world leader is Henry Kissinger because his name comes to 666 and also the word vaccination comes to 666 using the same code. Put the next one on, please, dear. Next one, the next word computer, that also adds up to 666. Someone said to me once, is it possible the computer is the Antichrist? No, it will be a man, but he will use a computer, no doubt. Next one, please. The word witchcraft also adds up to 666, and therefore you see that the seals on the dollar are witchcraft seals. We're dealing with a very powerful demon, so powerful that they destroyed the World Trade Center. And as I said last night, one of the top men in the University of New Mexico who was involved in demolition tells us that it is his strong opinion and the opinion of many others that those towers were demolished or imploded from within. And people who came down the stairs said they could hear explosions inside there. And they fell ex exactly right to the ground like that. They were looking for a crisis that would introduce the new world order. And now they have power over everybody on earth. Everybody is terrified. And therefore they will go to any means to accept a chip or anything like that to make sure the world is safe. Got the idea? It's strange stuff, I tell you. Did you hear the news tonight? George Bush knew beforehand about the attacks. It was on tonight's news. I stayed back specially to hear that piece of news, and I thought, goodness, I said it last night, and here it is on the news tonight. And the world government people knew more than George W. Bush because they are involved in setting up situations to prepare the world for a one-world government. Believe me. Next one, please. New York also adds up to 666, and there you have 666 for New York. Now, we mentioned also that in America, the center of politics is Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., there are 666 members of the American government. Let's go through them, shall we? One president, 14 cabinet members, 100 senators, 435 representatives, 9 Supreme Court justices, 13 appeals court justices, 90 district court chief justices, and 4 territory justices. Total, 666. And when I was preaching in some of these big cities like Detroit and Chicago and so on, people stood up in two cities and they said, Mr. Smith, they have added two more to the American government system. I said, that's right, and they've taken two off, which brings it back to 666. <laughs> the next one. And so we see that the stock market is, go has, is going to collapse shortly. We will have an economic change. Everybody keeping up? Yeah. Doing my best. We'll get through, all right? 
economic change. We're moving to a cashless society, the mark of the beast. I dealt with that last night. The silicon chip, which is the size of a grain of rice, and the first family to receive it as a family were in America. Do you remember the father, the son, the son and the daughter? Father, the mother, the son and the daughter all received the very chip in their arm for medical purposes, not for buying and selling. But now it's only the size of a grain of rice. They will lower it from the arm to the hand or the head for buying and selling exactly as the Word of God says. Okay, what else do we see? The world trade will now move from New York to Europe. The US dollar will be weakened and make way for the Euro dollar only when the American dollar goes down. So keep watching, please, for that man in charge of the Federal Reserve says, uh, I cannot lower the interest rates anymore. And Rome, of course, is the one that we are looking for for religion. Now, there are further attacks coming on those three areas, but I want to just share this with you now, if I may. This being the case, you say, all right, what, what, where are we up to now? We're living at a point in history where those three areas are under the judgment of God. New York, next one, is uh, Washington, D.C., and Rome. Now, Rome hasn't been hit yet, but if you check the book of Revelation, chapter 18, you'll see that it is the beast or the Antichrist that comes against the world church. So it will be destroyed by the world, world uh, political system, ultimately. Politics will destroy religion. But in the meantime, the attacks have taken place on two of those areas. Now, there's a man called David Wilkerson. He was asked, and I said to my friend Keith Jones, who runs my office, would you get on the internet, please? I want to know what Wilkerson's saying. Wilkerson has a church in Times Square. He, says, he said, we were warned months before something was going to happen. We cancelled all the prayer meetings. Sorry, we cancelled all the uh, visiting ministries. We cancelled all the missions. We cancelled all preaching. We went to fasting and prayer, and we were not surprised when it happened. They said to him, is what you saw on September the 11th, what God showed you in the vision? He said, no, no. No, he said, it's only the beginning. He said, the whole city of New York was going to be wiped out completely, just a mass of dust. That's powerful stuff, everybody. You say, ooh. Now, that being the case, I am now ready to show you the, the link up now using the obelisks. I've shown you these a minute ago. Would you notice that each of those three areas has an obelisk, first of all? Uh, down here, please. Up, here we go. First of all, Rome's got one and St. Peter's Square. That's a sign of Freemasonry. Washington's got one. That's called the Washington Monument. I knew that London had one. That was called uh, Cleopatra's Needle. But I said to my office manager, Keith, would you check New York, please, and see if they have one? He got on the internet. He found New York has got one. And you'll never guess what it's called. It's called Cleopatra's Needle. The same as the one in England is the same as the one in New York. And then when I was preaching in England last time, we used a building there called the City Temple, which is situated in the city of London. Did you know in London there is a city within a city? Not many people know this. Even in England they don't know this. The city of London is a square mile. They call it the square mile. And, and I came out of this building, the City Temple, where I was preaching. It cost us a thousand pounds a night to hire it. That's three thousand New Zealand dollars a night. We had to pay for that, so I'm not going there again. <laughs> What a rip-off. I thought they were Christians. Never mind. <laughs> I came out of the city temple, and there's a policeman standing there. I said, could you tell me, please, where does the city of London start? He said, right there by the bridge. There are two gargoyles. They look like giant, horrible-looking, demonic figures. He said, there's a square mile. That's where it starts. You're in it now, sir, he said. I said, is it true you've got your own police force? He said, yes. He said, I belong to the city of London. They have their own police force, they have their own law system, they have their own diplomats, and when the Queen wants to go in there, she can't. The Queen has to get permission from the Lord Mayor. And so when she goes in, the Lord Mayor comes with his sword, he lowers it, she takes the sword from him, gives it back to him, and then he leads her into the city. And at the end of the day, all the workers go home. In there you'll find the Grand Lodge of Freemasonry, you'll find the Bank of England, all these great buildings in there that control the whole system. Now, in my pocket I have an American dollar, and I learnt this, that on every American dollar, if you get yourself one, you will find this. I used to have an American dollar. Has anybody got one? Come on, give us a dollar, someone. Be kind. Here it is. Thanks, I got it. If you check on here, it says Federal Reserve Note. Now, a bank manager told me this. That is, it should not say that. It should say United States note. That's what it used to say years ago. 
1913, they brought in the Federal Reserve Act, and a bunch of private people from Europe took over the economy of America. And the economy of America is now run not from America, but from Europe. And the headquarters is London, the city of London. They control the Federal Reserve from there. They do, these people are not audited. They are not part of the American government. The whole system is controlled from Europe. I hope that's clear. And that's why when you look at the obelisks, let's have a look again, please. You can see now they're both called the same. New York is controlled from London, and that's why they have their two obelisks of the same name, called Cleopatra's Needle. What do you think of that? Interesting. Now, you say, all right, where does that bring us? Well, it brings us to the next point. <laughs> that, are there going to be any more attacks on the, on the area? Yes. Have a look, please. According to the prophecies that God has shown, and, uh, and also from knowledge that we have, there will be more chemical, biological, and fire attacks. Taken from the Time magazine years ago, have a look at this. America the vulnerable. A disaster is just waiting to happen if Iraq unleashes its poisons and germs. Who else is vulnerable? Answer, England, Great Britain. Have a look at this one, please. UK port alert on Iraq anthrax plot. Why? Because Tony Blair and the American presidents always worked together. Do you remember when Bill Clinton was in power? It was Tony and Bill. Now it's Tony and George. Get the idea? Because they work together because England controls America's financial system. Get the idea? Now that being the case, we're not surprised when we see a headline like this. Let's read it together, shall we? Blair looks forward to a new world order. Tony Blair appealed to George Bush last night to swing the United States away from isolationism in the aftermath of September the 11th. Now the question is, you know they're trying to get into Iraq at the moment, and George Bush is saying, when I'm finished in Afghanistan, we will attack the axis of evil. What is the axis of evil? Iraq, um, uh, Iran, and North, and North Korea. Now, he didn't think that up by himself. Did you know that George Bush does not make his own speeches? They are made for him by the order. And so when he said the axis of evil, I don't really think he really understood what he was saying. He has to keep fighting. If you get hold of that video I spoke about last night called The Skulls, which is based on the, this group from Yale University, a secret society, it takes you down into the vault in that video and you'll see there the pentagram there, and you'll see the word on the wall of the lodge. It's called war, W-A-R. They must continually have wars. You'll also see a, a swastika on the wall there because this is a German secret society within the halls of Yale University. Who belongs to it? George W. Bush, the president, his father, and his grandfather before him. If you see the video, you'll see them branding them there with a branding iron, and then they put a watch over the top of it. They all given a key so they can get into this building and so on. Now, where did the people in Iraq get their biological weapons from? Answer, from America. Did you know when they were going to attack Iran, America sent all these biological and chemical weapons across there so that Iraq could attack Iran. However, they didn't. Saddam Hussein buried them in bunkers, and now he's going to attack America with them. You say, can you prove that? Yes, I have them, have them all here. Thank you. Everybody have a look, please. I've got all the batch numbers and everything here. Have a look at this. There it is. That's where the Gulf War syndrome comes from. There are all the batch numbers. These were sold to Iraq by the United States prior to the Gulf War. Look at them all. And the batch numbers are all there. And that's why I want to say this, that because America is going down the tubes financially, we're living in a strange time in history. And I want to say this tonight also. I love America. Anybody who's been there will love it. It's a great country. If you want to have a good time, that's the place to go. It's so interesting. I love motor cars. And boy, if you want to see cars, that's the place to go. Come back to Aussie and New Zealand, all you see is little Japanese cars. But over there, great big things, I love them. I drive a pickup truck. And I said to my driver as we sped across America, look at all these pickup trucks, there's dozens of them. I said, if I lived here, who'd buy a motor car? I'd buy a pickup truck. Do you know there are so many big semi-trailers over there? I counted them. He said, I'll time you. Ten minutes, I counted a hundred trucks in ten minutes. You imagine how many trucks we passed. We went through 38 states in two and a half weeks. There's just masses of them traveling all over. Do you remember I told you last night they are strengthening the bridges over there, putting steel beams under all the bridges, ready for the final takeover of the United States by the United Nations? 
ready for the tanks to come over the bridges. They're doing that all over the place. And the United Nations troops are training in Alamogordo, New Mexico, 250,000 Russians and Germans getting ready. And what George is going to do is send his troops out of the country. And while they're out of the country, the United Nations takes over. You get the idea. America was set up for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. But the good news is, Jesus is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Now listen everybody, don't get excited. Some people say, I wish I'd never gone to that meeting. I was happy before I heard him. <laughs> now watch this. Watch this. With the American economy collapsed, Israel will have to trust God. Let's read it together. With the US economy destroyed... Israel will be forced to depend on God. And I want to tell you, Ezekiel 38 and 39 will be fulfilled in our lifetime. You'll see all the enemies come. Russia will come down, led by a demon called Gog, who lives in a spiritual area called Magog, and they will attack. And all the forces of the enemy around about them will come against them. But the Bible says very clearly that God will look after Israel in those days. Now, I want to make it quite clear tonight. God loves everybody. Some of you come from Arab countries surrounding there. I recognize this. There are lovely Christian Arab people who love Jesus. I have a lot of good friends there. When I go over there, I go to their houses for a cup of coffee. I know them very well. But God has got plans for all these people. And in the book of Isaiah, turn with me, please. I want to encourage you tonight. Any of you from that particular area, you need to know this. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter something. I'm going to look for it. hope I can find it after having said that. Here it is. It's Isaiah chapter 19. This is so lovely. In the last days when Jesus comes back, God has got plans for the whole area of the Middle East. Let's read together. Verse 23. Underline this in your Bible. If you have your own Bible, underline it. If you have someone else's, don't underline it. <laughs> Isaiah 19:23. Altogether, in that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt into Assyria. Excuse me, Assyria is a mixture of Syria and Iraq. That's where Assyria is. So there's going to be a highway right across from that area where Saddam Hussein is and Syria down into Egypt. Then it says here, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. Verse 24, read with me. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. 25, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Praise God. And Jesus will be king over the whole area, and he is God. Jesus is God. There'll be no more rebellions, no more fighting, for as soon as an evil thought comes into anybody's mind, God will know it, and Jesus knows it afar off. And he'll say, don't do it. What else is on there? What, what, what am I talking about over there? <laughs> okay, thanks. Got my mind back on it. What a job. I'll never forget one night we were in Melbourne, you know, and, a, and a, there was, a, witch, there was a, a warlock in the meeting, and he put a curse on me, and I didn't know what I was doing. I got halfway through my message, my mind went blank. And I called her and said, what on earth am I talking about? And I said to all the pastors, come and pray for me, please, I don't know what I'm talking about. And they prayed for me and it came back, I could see where I was. Another night in New Zealand, the Freemasons uh, bound me up. I was sitting in a meeting, don't you, don't you play with power, everybody? These are demonic people. And they were sitting in the back row, they sent a whole group across to Blenheim, near where I live. And when I went to praise the Lord, I couldn't get my arms up. I was like this. I said, Satan, you're giving me a hard time, but I'm going to give it to you tonight. And then they said, Barry Smith will now speak. I stumbled to the platform. I managed to get up, hanging on to everything. And I stood like this. And suddenly I came free. I said, I'm free. And I saw them sitting in the back row. I gave them a hard time. And when it was all over, a friend of mine, very powerful in deliverance, came up to me. And my mate said, you had a hard time tonight, eh, bro? I said, sure did. He said, I walked into the meeting. God showed me they put a curse on you. They were binding you. So I went out in the toilet and set you free. <laughs> Good stuff. 
There's no greater power than the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you want to drive a demon, don't use any other name, just that name. Have you noticed when people hit their finger with a hammer, they always use that name? <laughs> because the devil hates it. And he sees to it you get the right name, you see. Very powerful name, the name of Jesus. All right, next thing. I now want to talk to you, before I bring this to a close, on why is there a pyramid on the back of the American dollar? Let's turn, shall we? No, in our Bibles to Isaiah 19. Let's read our verse together, shall we? Isaiah 19, a reference to the pyramid in, 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 uh, in uh, Egypt. Now, what you're going to hear tonight is probably new to most of you because it was new to me. In fact, when I preached on this in South Africa, uh, the people wouldn't buy my tapes in one particular area. They said, this man is into the occult because they weren't listening clearly. I'll tell you why it happened like that. Because it was something new, they couldn't accept it. Some people don't like to learn anything. And my son is very good, actually. He, uh, my son, Andrew, he speaks. He does a lot of motivational work with different groups in New Zealand and preaches the gospel on Sundays. But watch this. I went to one of his meetings. He drew this on the board. He put 100%. And so he gets all these people coming in from telecom and different groups. And he says, now, of course, there'll be people in there who are smart Alex. They know everything, you see. So he says, uh, good morning, everybody. He said, in our gathering today, uh, I want to point out that this represents 100% of the world's knowledge. I'd like to ask you, how much of that do you possess? <laughs> and you can see all the people sitting there thinking. And my wife and I were watching, it was so funny. And I saw a lady put a hand up, she said, 3%? <laughs> and everybody laughed at her. Do you know that nobody in this meeting has got one fraction of 1%? of the knowledge of the world. And then he says, is it possible you could still learn something? And they're all sitting very humble at that point. <laughs> I like that. And just because you've never heard of this before, don't you say that I'm a false teacher. Listen and enjoy it. I am answering a question that nobody that I have ever heard of has answered. I said, Lord, help me, because this is my subject. Why on earth is there a pyramid on the back of the American dollar? What link-up is there between America and Egypt? Answer, none at all, except in the field of the occult. And if you look at that uh, a pyramid on the dollar, it is one that I have been to three times. In fact, I've been inside it. And we're going to read about it now in Isaiah 19, 19. All together. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because the oppressors, and he shall send them a saviour and a great one, and he shall deliver them. There's a reference to Jesus, you see. He shall send them a saviour. His name is Jesus, the biggest name on my chart. I started preaching this some time ago, and I was home in bed one night. We live at Polaris Bridge in the top of the South Island. I got a telephone call from Christchurch. This man rang up and he said, you Barry Smith? And I said, yes, he said, why do you talk about the pyramid in your meetings? He said, you destroy your credibility. He said, that passage in Isaiah does not refer to the pyramid. I said, what does it refer to? He said, I don't know. So I said, I said, good night. <laughs> Goodness gracious, the arrogance of the man. I spent all this time putting it together and he didn't listen. He thought he knew. Now, I'm going to share a lot of stuff. This is so exciting. You'll like this. So we're going to finish on a good note tonight. It'll cheer you up. <laughs> what do we know about the pyramid? First of all, we're talking about the pyramid at Giza. Now, the pyramid at Giza, G-I-Z-A, can be spelt G-I-Z-E-H. Same thing. And I want you to know that the pyramid at Giza was not designed by the Egyptians, nor was it built by the Egyptians. It was built by strangers in the land of Egypt. Have a look at this, please. You folks were on the Egypt trip. Remember that? Did you come up on the roof of that hotel with us? Oh, this is interesting. Last year we were over there, and um, we were in this hotel near the pyramid in Cairo, and I went to the desk. I said, could we hire a room for the night, please, to have a meeting about the pyramids? And the lady said, yes, $200. I said, cancel the order. Thank you. <laughs> $200 the cheek of it. I'm not a Scrooge, but I tell you what, I can't stand that. So I said to the people, come on, we sneaked up the stairs onto the roof. 
when we got on the roof of the hotel, there were the pyramids all lit up. And we gave this talk to them sitting on the roof of the hotel next to the pyramids. It's exciting. Now, this is a very special pyramid. Let me ask you a question. Has Egypt ever been useful to the people of God or a blessing to the people of God? Yes, in the Old Testament, tell me three people who were blessed. Old Testament. Joseph, Moses, Abraham. Good. It's like drawing blood out of a stone. <laughs> this is the next one. In the New Testament, please. Jesus. Therefore, God has a debt that he is going to pay back to Egypt. He's put something in there that belongs to him. Now, what did our verse say? It says, it is unto the Lord, not to Michael Jackson, who sleeps under one, or to... I couldn't care less where Michael Jackson sleeps, I'll be quite frank with you. Some people tell me it's an occult symbol. No, it's not. It's unto the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. It is not new age. It's unto the Lord. It doesn't belong to the Freemasons. It's unto the Lord. Now, what do we know about it? It's a altar. Someone else? It's a pillar. It's a sign and a witness unto the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Now, have a look at this. Designed by God Almighty. The design is so clever... They tell me that you cannot re replicate it. The Japanese have tried to. They tried to build one the same, one third the size, using a computer, but they couldn't do it. Only God could have designed that magnificent structure. It was designed by, it was built by strangers in the land of Egypt. And while the strangers were there, they worshiped one God only and shut down all the Egyptian houses of worship and temples. Once the strangers left the country, they opened up all their temples again. It was designed on the pi principle. Could someone tell me the calculation, please? Sounds like a religious meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Would someone say it in a clear voice, please? Say it over here again. 3.14. Thank you. Okay. Now, some of you are sitting there wondering what it's all about. The pi principle, some of you went to school, you understand it. The, the circumference around the base of the pyramid, it has a radius which is halfway across there, is equal to the height of the building. And only God could have got the angles right so everything was perfect. They can't replicate it. They've tried and tried and tried, but they can't do it. Remember, pi, P-I, is part of the Greek alphabet, and the Greeks came after the Egyptians, but God had pi before the, before the Greeks got it. That's interesting. I think it is anyway. Now have a look at this one. It is visible from the moon. You can't see anything else on earth, just that pyramid. It is one of the seven wonders of the world. It was built with 2.4 million blocks of granite. That's a lot. And it, and it was covered with limestone blocks. How many? There were 144,000 limestone slabs. And it was like a giant searchlight. As the sun hit it, the rays shone as far away as Israel. They could see that thing, but uh, robbers have been there and robbed the limestone blocks off it now. <clears throat> it is outstanding in mathematical design. Next. It is located on the border of North and South Egypt. It is positioned exactly North, South, East and West. The, the, it is just so exact. Mathematicians are amazed. The internal passages, uh, there are two of them. One goes up, it's called to the King's Chamber. Inside, I've been into that one. Then there's another one goes down to the pit. Now the King's Chamber represents heaven. And the pit represents hell. That is the end result of everybody's lives. In 100 years, all of us will either be in heaven or hell, depending on what we do at the cross, where Jesus Christ shed his blood to get us to heaven. That's clear, isn't it? Now, if you want to measure inside that thing, because you've got to learn to measure, you'll find out the history of the world is there. It's called a history book in stone. And I was sorry when we moved off uh, the old system to metrics, because I lost one of my best jokes. <laughs> Listen to it. He that thinks by the inch and speaks by the yard should be kicked by the foot. <laughs> Do you like that one? And so if you want to measure inside the passages, one inch equals one year. Now we're going to put another one on. Watch this, please. Here we go. You're a good man, brother. Were you? It was a good exercise. <laughs> Thank you so much. Would you notice, please, <coughs> there's the ascending passage, finishes at the king's chamber. There is the descending passage, finishes in the pit. Now, I'm going to draw it for you here on the board. Here's the pyramid. Notice the ascending passage. 
goes up. There is a room crossing it called the King's Chamber, and you'll see there a symbol, a symbol of the cross. cross. Inside the King's Chamber, there is a coffin or a sarcophagus made of stone with no lid on it, and that speaks of the resurrection. There has never been any body in that thing, they, 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 they claim. It is so big, they cannot take it out down the passages because it is bigger than the passages. So that means it was put in there before the thing was finished. God knew exactly what he was doing. <clears throat> it's a special structure with a history of the world in stone. Now, would you notice this? If you measure up the passages, you go one inch up here or a few inches, you'll come to the place where Moses was given the law. You measure a few more inches up there, you'll find the birth of Jesus Christ. You measure a little bit further, you find the crucifixion. You go further, you find the date for World War I. You find the date for World War II and so on. There are many things in there. That's only a few of them. And the final date is the year 2000. Now, some of you will be asking the question, why is the final date 2000? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we sink back in our seats, disillusioned. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, if you were to sit on top of the pyramid, which is not easy to do, but if you were to sit there with a giant compass, <laughs> in fact, if you try and get up there, they'll pull you down. I had some uh, boys on our tour that got up there. They paid extra money to the guards at the bottom, and they managed to get up. It's a long haul to get up there. Believe me, the blocks are massive. If you sit right on top of the pyramid with a giant compass, you could touch every point on the coast of Egypt. Look at that on the Mediterranean. It comes right round. This shows you the miraculous uh, things behind this thing. It takes in the whole of Egypt. This is South Egypt in a big circle and that is North Egypt. It's right on the border and the word Giza means at the border. If you draw a line or scribe a line from the base of the pyramid out to the northeast, it'll take you right through the Red Sea where Moses crossed with the children of Israel. It'll take you right through the city of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. It'll take you right to the Jordan River where Joshua crossed with the children of Israel into the Promised Land. That is called the Christ Line. Exciting? Yes. And Christians need to know this, not to worship the pyramid, but to worship the God who designed this marvelous thing. Yes. You say, what else do you know? We're now going to read a verse that your pastor has never read to you. <laughs> Let's read it together, shall we? Genesis 10, 25, all together. And unto Eber were born two sons, and the name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now I thought to myself, what on earth does that mean? And I discovered. When my office manager got this chart drawn for me, he drew it himself, I did a dance in the privacy of my office, which you are allowed to do in your own place. Have a look at this, please. I want you to notice the position of the pyramid, there is the equator down to the south here, but God did not have it put on the equator. There would have been too much sea water. So he had it moved to the north in North Africa or Egypt. And if you look at it carefully, you'll find that the land area to the northwest is exactly the same as the land area to the northeast, is exactly the same as the land area to the southwest, is exactly the same as the land area to the southeast, including Australia and New Zealand. And thus, in the days of Peleg, was the earth divided. Who likes that? In other words, that tells me that God knows exactly what he's doing. Every detail is beloved of God. He loves the northeast, the northwest, the southeast, the southwest. He loves everybody. John 3:16 altogether, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, who who really owns the pyramid? Well, I know the occultists want it. They are desperate to get their hands on it. The Freemasons love it. I've read books in Freemasons with a lot of, each, a lot of um, uh, pyramid stuff in there. The occultists want it. On the 31st of December, 1999, the New World Order planned to use a helicopter to bring in a golden capstone. There is no capstone on the pyramid. And every time we go, I always ask the guide, where's the capstone? I know the answer, but he, I like to hear him. <laughs> where's the capstone? And they say, we don't know, sir don't know. Not only did they plan to put a golden capstone on, they planned to have an occult meeting in the king's chamber dedicating the new millennium to Lucifer. I want to tell you this everybody, they had the meeting. I've checked it out, they had the occult meeting. This millennium has been dedicated to Lucifer, 
but he will only run the world for three and a half years with these front men called Antichrist and the false prophet, and then Jesus will come. We're living right at the end of a generation. Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And do you know what happened was this. The meeting went ahead as planned. They dedicated the millennium to Lucifer, but they did not put the capstone on. And when we were there last year, I said to the guide again, why didn't you put the capstone on, you guys? He said, everything was ready. The helicopter was ready to go. The golden capstone was there, but the government cancelled it at the last moment. I was so disappointed because I'd written it all up in my book. This is going to happen. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying, everybody. It's in my book. Imagine how I felt. I went to bed like a flat balloon. I said, oh, Lord. I've already put it in my book and it never happened. And I said, why didn't it happen? He said, we don't know. They just cancelled the helicopter at the last moment and no one knows why. Do you know what they said? The excuse they used, it might damage the original structure. What nonsense is this? Six, how many? 2.4 million granite blocks. You're going to damage it. What nonsense. So I went to bed disillusioned. I got a telephone call at 2 in the morning from Wales. I have a phone next to my bed so I can speak without opening my eyes. <laughs> a telephone call from Wales, is that Brother Smith? You know, they sort of sing, is that Brother Smith? <laughs> I said, yes, brother. He says, calling from Wales. I said, do you know what time it is? No, he said, never mind that. He said, isn't it exciting about the pyramid? I said, what's exciting? They didn't put the capstone on. I said, what's exciting about that? I said, I'm not excited. He said, you should be, brother, because Jesus wouldn't let them do it. And I leapt out of bed and I shouted, that's the answer. Jesus wouldn't let them do it. And I'll tell you why. Because Lucifer is not the capstone of history. Jesus is. Amen. Now we're learning something. Now I want to show you this. We'll put the next one on now. We're now going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Oh, this is... God's knowledge is progressive, you will agree? you a little, little bit, a little, it's like jigsaw puzzle, you see? Let's read it together, 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Now listen, folks, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Kiwi, I'm a New Zealander. English is my first language, but that does not make sense to me. I'll be quite frank with you, it might make sense to some of you, not to me. I'm too ignorant to really understand that. So because my wife is from the island of Samoa, we have some Samoans here tonight, I can speak that language and preach in it, you see. And one time, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I was preaching at a Samoan camp, and I read that verse to them in their language. Now, it wouldn't mean much to you people, but this is what it says. When I was a young fellow, for example, I learned that this stone down here is called the chief corner stone. Did you learn that at Sunday school? When a building is built, they put in a stone and then they build the whole building from that stone to keep it at level, square and level. <coughs> so I'm going to draw this now. Watch this. Now this is what it says in Psalm 1. They call the stone at the bottom, um, Ma'atulimanu. You Psalm 1 people know this. Ma'atulimanu ua avea fo'i malema'a lunga, which means the stone at the bottom has become the stone right at the very top. It doesn't say that in English. It's not clear in English, but it's clear in that language. And I shouted, Hallelujah! Anybody who speaks any Polynesian language knows that. Ilunga, the Maoris, Kirunga, right at the top, you see? So you start at the bottom. The stone at the bottom has become the capstone right at the very top. Anybody got an NIV Bible, please? Who's got an NIV? Read it out, please, in a loud voice, bro. That verse, 1 Peter 2.7. NIV, listen to this. We're right at the end of the meeting. Be of good cheer. <laughs> listen to this. First, have you got it, Don? Who's got NIV? Let's have it, please. Loud voice. Thank you. <laughs> Woohoo, there it is. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. So we will now put this on. Now listen, when I, I preached this first of all in London, 
And I, I'll tell you what, we had the whole audience on their feet shouting. And if you can get an audience of English people shouting, you've done something. <laughs> I'm telling you. Now I want to show you this. Everybody get ready now, watch this please. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, he's the capstone. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. <clears throat> he's the alpha, the omega, the author and the finisher. He that started it will finish it. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. There it is. <coughs> <clears throat> and so David Wilkerson, the man of God, said, Lord, what do we do in the light of all this? And he said he got a message from God, and I share it with you quickly now. He said there are three things God showed him when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt at the time of the Passover. God showed them three things they had to do. Here they are. Number one is get under the blood. The second one was eat the lamb. And the third one was get ready to go. And I want to say to all of you tonight, the first one, get ready. Now the first one is get under the blood. In the days of the Passover, the children of Israel, the father of each family used to take a lamb. He would examine it for 72 defects and he would kill it. How many defects? 72 defects. And if it was perfect in every way, he would kill it, take the blood and put it on the side posts there and there. That's a picture of the cross. Can I say to every man in this meeting tonight, you, if you're a father and a husband, you are responsible for yourself, your wife and your children and your descendants after you. It was the father who did that. And I'm excited to tell you this, friends, that when we were in Israel last year, we, we met an old Israeli uh, gospel preacher. We had a meeting with him. We said, what do you preach to the Jewish people for goodness sake? What do you tell them? This, he said, this is what I tell them. Anybody who's in the ministry, write this down, please. He said, from AD 70, there has never been a blood sacrifice in Israel. Write that down, please. Every Jew knows it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. There has never been, since Titus came and destroyed the temple, there has never been a blood sacrifice. And that means unless they receive Jesus, they are lost. Because Jesus is the ultimate Lamb of God who shed his blood. When you come on Saturday night, you'll see how powerful his blood is. It's the most exciting message Saturday night, I promise you. It doesn't matter what's on television, be here. And I've got a guide over there. I love this man. I love this man. Every time I go, he gives me a big hug. He's got a big beard. Lovely guy. I've never tried to convert him, but I give him my books to read. And I said, I've never tried to convert you, but you know what to do. And when I was there last year, he was in the garden tomb. I walked and there he was sitting. I said, brother, I'll call him brother. Don't want to use his name on a tape. Brother, Barry, he says, give me a big hug. I said, you know, I've never tried to convert you. I've been here 18 times. Never have I ever tried. He said, thank you, I appreciate that. He said, everybody else tries. <laughs> you can imagine all the people from overseas, you go, and boast, go home boasting, saying, I've won this guy for Christ. He's a Jewish guide, is he? I said, I've never tried to do that. The Bible says that I'm supposed to provoke you to jealousy. And if you see I've got something you need, you'll go for it because you're a Jew. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> he said, I appreciate that. I said, now listen, I heard a, a preacher last night, one of your own people saying this, from AD 70, there has never been a blood sacrifice. I said, you're an archaeologist, you're an intelligent man, I'm not here to insult you. Your intellect will tell you that's correct. Therefore, my friend, if we want to get to heaven, we need blood sacrifice because it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. That's in your own Bible. And if you don't accept Jesus, I can't see you in heaven. But I love you and I want to see you in heaven. I've got to go back to New Zealand. Goodbye. I hope we'll see you next year. I went out through the door of the little bookshop up the road and the Lord says, go back. I went back through the bookshop and I yelled out, hey, brother. I says, get under the blood. Please, I want to see you in heaven. And then I left him. I never saw him again. I believe there's a day coming. He will receive Christ. Amen. We all need to get under the blood. For without the blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Number two, eat the lamb. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is the lamb and they had to roast it and eat it. That means when we receive Jesus, we get our Bibles out. We have Bible readings with our families. The fathers will read to the children at night. We'll have a Bible study in our home. And when we have the Bible study, we will all be excited. We will train the children to enjoy it and make it part of life. 
So their mouths don't go like that, they'll go like this. And they will all answer questions. I'll say, that, now let's read this together, shall we? When you read to your children, you look at them. <laughs> and you say, that was good, wasn't it? John, yes, Dad. Did you enjoy that, Mary? Yes. What did you enjoy, Mary? I've just forgotten for the moment. <laughs> we'll have it again, shall we, Mary? And you have a Bible study with your family every night after the evening meal. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And when I used to come home from work, my wife would have the four children on the floor teaching them Bible verses. What do mothers do today? They put them in front of television, stuff their heads full of that rubbish. And I come home and my wife would have the kids repeating about 60 verses from the Bible with the references. Sitting at her feet, spending time with the kids. You've only got them for a short time, mothers. For goodness sake, turn the box off and teach them the Bible. Feast on the Lamb. Get to know Jesus. Enjoy Him. And share your sorrows and your joys with Him. And the last one is get ready to go. And if there's stuff in your life that is not good, say, Lord, speak to me and I'll get rid of the rubbish that I might live for you in these last days. Anybody who needs to receive Christ tonight? The best place to do it is right up the front. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and receive Jesus. Some of you say, Barry, I've never done it, but I'd like to do it tonight. Well, it's quite clear what to do. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him also will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Simple English, stand up for Jesus now, and he will stand for you there when you need a lawyer most of all. Excuse me, everybody. Don't be distracted. Some people say, oh, he's finished. Now I can just go to sleep. No, no, this is the best part. Don't you be distracted. I've been on my deathbed. I've had four bypasses in my heart, I tell you. I've been right on the point of death. And when you're there, you'll forget about everything else. You'll say, thank God I went to that meeting. Thank God I listened to that guy. And thank God I went to the front and gave my life to Jesus. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I've been there. I've been there. I forgot about my wife. I forgot about my children. I forgot about my car. I forgot about my house. I forgot about my meetings, everything. Nothing mattered. Only one thing, that I was right with God. And Jesus said, you must confess it before men. And I invite you to get out of your seat and do it tonight. Husbands, wives, old and young. You make your way to the front with a friend or by yourself and give your life to Christ tonight. We're going to sing our song, Amazing Grace. Let's stand, shall we, in Jesus' name tonight. <coughs> <coughs> Let's sing it. Amazing Good. Good, man. So twas grace that my heart to and my feet for the third verse or some in the uh, outreach in the room out there we invite you to come in you're watching on the video screen you make your way to Jesus tonight please come in and join with us here in the front and this is where we are entering a covenant relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ it will not be with a signature it will not be with a handshake it is sealed with the precious blood of Christ and as you come tonight you do it in front of men just like when you got married you stood in front of people to witness what you were doing and you'll be saved by the grace of God. I'm calling for group number two. Some of you have received the Lord in a back room or a pastor's office, but you've never stood for Christ. That's why you're very weak. 
I want you to get out of your row tonight. You come and stand with these people and he will listen to what you'll see what you're doing and you'll go strong as from now, I promise. Third group, anybody who's away from God, you used to walk with Jesus, but you're away from him tonight. I want you to come back under the blood of Christ. Time is running out. We are at the end of a generation. It is time to come. Some of you say, I can't get out. Yes, you can. People will move as you make your way to Jesus. Some of you say, I'm a bit nervous. Turn to the person next to you and somebody will come with you. And as long as we sing, the floor is open for you to stand for Jesus Christ. Let me pray, Father, for those who should be here. We, we set them free in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, you are now free from every demonic power and you can come and give your life to the Lord tonight and be saved through his precious blood. In the name of Jesus, amen. Through many dangers, through many husbands some men are too slow women and children receive Jesus quickly and men mess around on the side would you men ask God to give you a backbone tonight please don't ever let me see a, a wife bringing her husband to the front that is degrading the husband is the head of the family he's supposed to be the head of a lion not the tail of a rat you agree so let the man come to the front properly get born again get a Bible and bring your family up in the ways of God God bless you. With one more verse, if I keep see, keep see the people keep coming, we keep singing. And when they stop coming, we stop singing. For it is a privilege to receive Jesus. God bless you. Let's sing it. When we. coming would you wave your hand to me please I must do my job properly because I answer to the Lord for every meeting I want to give everybody a fair go anybody else need to come wave your hand please sometimes people last they wait till the last verse and then they rush out the front is there anybody like that tonight congregation be seated please we'll pray with those who are here God bless lovely dear good would you folks bow your heads tonight please you have a Christian counselor behind you one who has already received the Lord Jesus, and they're going to help you through with the prayer as you pray the sinner's prayer tonight. Now remember, it's a covenant. Keep your eyes closed. Hear me, please. As Jesus hung on the cross, he prayed his half. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Tonight, you're going to say your half and be saved by the grace of God. Pray it out loud. Don't mumble, please. Speak nice and loudly, and God will save you as you say your covenant prayer. Follow me, those watching the video. And those listening to the tape, this is your opportunity also. Out loud, Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you tonight because I am a sinner. Tonight, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. And I turn to Jesus. I believe, dear Lord, I believe, dear you, died for me. you died for me. Your blood covers my sin, and washes away my sin. I thank you tonight. I, thank you tonight. I open the door to my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me, Make me your child as I receive you by faith. As I, you by faith. I, receive you by faith. I, receive you I believe, dear Lord, 
I close the door now with Jesus inside. Help me to live for you every day until you come again. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Tonight I have received you in the presence of these witnesses and you have received me. I love you and praise you for saving me tonight. Dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just keep your eyes closed and hear the promise. There's a lovely promise from John chapter 1, verse 12. Listen. But as many as received Him, that's Jesus, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. That includes ladies as well as men. All of you in the front, look at me now if you would. And at 25 past 9, we're going to call it at 9.25 on the 16th of May, 2002, I say, welcome to the family of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Give them a hug. Give them a welcome. Give them a hug, please. Give these people a hug. Give these people a welcome. <clears throat> now, does anybody out there know any of these people? If you know somebody, get out of your seat and come and give them a hug, would you please? Just rush up the front. Come on. There's joy in the presence of the angels over a sinner that repents. And if you've got a loved one here, come and give them a greeting. It's more natural than sitting there looking at them. Give them a hug. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, I've got to get up on a chair now to say the last bit. Watch this, please. Oh, dear. Here, here I am. Excuse me. Watch this. I'm going to give all of you a new birth certificate. We're going to ask you to write on your birth certificate at 9.25 on the 16th of May, 2002. I sign your name, receive the Lord Jesus as my Saviour. I thank Him. I want you to glue that on the front page of your Bible. If you haven't got one, buy one tomorrow or get one from a Christian. It's much cheaper. <laughs> now remember, there are four steps to make you strong. Tonight you've stood for Christ, now we've got to get on with the job. So in order to get on with the job, you read what to do here. Number one, pray daily. Every morning, open the curtain, say, Good morning, Father. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Going to walk with you today. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Number two, get yourself a Bible. Start in the Gospel of John. Read to one another. Find a friend, husbands and wives, backwards and forwards. Read it. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Start in the Gospel of John. talks about salvation, everlasting life. Remember the rules? Dirty Bible, clean Christian. Clean Bible, dirty Christian. Everybody look at their neighbor's Bible. <coughs> Number three, tell your friends to be here on, excuse me, tell your friends be here on Saturday night. This is one of the most exciting things you'll ever hear, I promise. You'll hear new stuff about the blood of Christ and the way of salvation and we won't pull any punches. I have preached this message all over the world and sometimes people try and kill me. But you look all right, so I'll do it here. <laughs> and number four, <clears throat> find a good church and go to it regularly. Birds of a feather flock together. You stick with the born-again Christian birds, and if you go to a church where your pastor is not born again, leave it. If you're not sure if he is, ask him. And if he gets angry, he's not. <laughs> and you find a good church, listen, baptize in water, filled with the Holy Spirit, and become a witness to Jesus Christ. God bless you. Now, I'm going to shake some hands. And as I come and shake hands with you, would you make your way in that direction? Do not leave the meeting, please, folks. We want these people to go to the counseling room. Thank you, Pastor North. Excuse me. Who's going to lead the way? Just over here. We need some on the mic. Now, them? as you receive your card, if you go with the counselors, the counseling room, every one of you will receive a commitment pact with a part of the Bible in it and some instructions, some help. Don't go away from keep in the line and you'll get something that will really help you praise God and I think while they're doing that that's right we might sing amazing grace while you're doing it or hallelujah we'll just play it softly that's right
Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful to see these people accepting the Lord? Give them a big clap, will you? Oh, bless you, my dear brother. What a blessing. What a blessing. Hallelujah. Oh, bless you, my brother. Hallelujah. You look excited already. You're a Christian. You're born again, brother. again in the family of God. Let's sing Amazing Grace together. Amazing Grace, come on. Amazing Grace, how sweet the Sing it. say anything else. I thought somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let's let's thank our brother Barry for a great meeting tonight. Bless you. Hallelujah. Oh, good. Hallelujah. Isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Exciting to be in the work of the Lord. Let's stand up and sing praise God as we close the meeting. Praise God. Praise God. Sing it. Praise God. Sing the name of Jesus as Pastor Barry said, the biggest name on the chart. Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord, for this night of joy, this night of blessing, to see people coming into the kingdom of God, Lord. What a miracle the new birth is. We pray that tonight, Lord, the, thy joy and peace and blessing will come into their souls as the being counseled now fill those rooms with your presence and your power. Thank you for a wonderful night of blessing and of instruction, of an enlightenment in your word. Bless our dear preacher, Lord, may he be refreshed in his body and bless his dear wife in New Zealand. We thank you for them and we pray that we will come together again for another great meeting on Saturday night and Sunday night and bless every home represented here, every church represented here, every pastor, every minister and every pastor's wife represented here, Lord. Let us all be blessed tonight. We give you all the praise and all the thanks in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a clap. Hallelujah. Now, if you're double parked or something like that, you could be the first out. Don't lose your sanctification Be here between here and the front gate. Shake hands with somebody now and wish them God's blessing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the books are out in the foyer.